Welcome back to Trending in Education. Mike Farmer here, joined by Vikram Baliga, the host of the Plan for Apology podcast. Vikram, welcome to Trending in Education. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's always fun to have a fellow podcaster on the pod because we feel like we can dispense with the amenities and get right oh, yeah. into the, the, the conversation. Your podcast is interesting. Your background is interesting. And I would love to, to hear a quick origin story for you in terms of what got you into horticulture and anthropology and what got you into the podcast and all that. And uh, we'll take it from there. Sure. So, gosh, you know, and these stories are never linear, right? It's always, it kind of twists and turns. So when I started school, gosh, you know, a, a minute or two ago at this point, I started my undergrad in biomedical engineering. And I did a year of that. And I was going to go build prosthetics and be a doctor and save the world. And I, I did an internship at a doctor's office and took uh, Cal 1 and 2 in college and realized that I hate calculus and I don't like blood. And so being an engineer and a doctor was going to be a problem for me. Right, right. <laughs> you know, my, my grandfather, actually, and my grandmother on my mom's side were both medical doctors. And mm. so growing up, I was like, oh, yeah, that's, you know, I grew up in doctor's offices because that's my mom and I lived with them. And that's what we did. We right. I would hung out there during the summer. And so that's always what I wanted to do. And then you know, after my first year of college, I was in this spot where I was like, okay, I have, no, I'm 19 years old. I have no idea what I'm doing with my life. Right, right. And a, and a, a Gen Studies advisor sat down and talked to me. I was like, well, what do you like? You told me that, you know, your grandfather got you interested. What else do you like? I was like, well, so like my earliest memories were being out gardening with him, growing vegetables and, and stuff. And so I got into horticulture my undergrad, I actually have a Bachelor of Arts in Horticulture and Landscape Design, Master of Science, and I'm also in Horticulture, and I'm finishing my, theoretically finishing my doctorate <laughs> at the moment. Right. And so I was talking with a friend, this would have been early last year, so early in 2019, just here at the greenhouse where I work, and we were just discussing uh, mesquite trees, something very specific, mesquite right. trees and the like anthropological connection they had to the area where we live. And just to uh, give the the sense of place to where you are situated and where mesquite trees might be part of your ecosystem, you are where exactly? I am in Lubbock, Texas, uh, right. which is about the flattest place in the universe. We like to say that you can watch a dog run away for two days here. And I always joke that, you know, pe the, when, when settlers were coming through this area, they stopped in Lubbock and they found some water and the horse died. And so they were stuck. And so that's why they ended up in Lubbock. But right, right. Uh, no, I grew up here. I mean, it's, it's home. And so the, the Taya Indians or the Taya, you know, people were mm -hmm. in this area in, in, you know, a historical context and managed this land with fire. Those were the tools they had. And so as cattle came through and grazing came through, the landscape changed. But if you go back, you find these mesquite trees in fossil records four or five, 6,000 years ago. Right, um, right. And, and so that's kind of what we were discussing is like this management and all of that. And I was like, you know what? This dorky, nerdy conversation yeah. would be a great podcast. It's a small batch varietal conversation about horticulture, you know, or yeah. plant ecosystems and, uh, you know, yeah. And it was, it was, it's so specific, right? But I was like, you know, this tells a story mm -hmm. ab about, about us as a species, I think, and the way that we work with the land or against the land. And yeah. civilizations throughout time have been better or worse than that, at yeah. that, you know? Yeah. And so I was like, man, this would be a great podcast. And he kind of laughed and we laughed and whatever, you know, I, well, I wasn't producing a podcast or anything. You know, I work full time here and about seven or eight months later in, in the fall, I was like, you know, I, I really was getting into listening to podcasts and educational mm -hmm. pods and stuff. And yeah. I was like, you know what? I really want to do this. Yeah. And so I just started it up. I didn't ask anybody and I just did it and they didn't fire me for doing it. So, but no, the university, so I work at Texas Tech University. I manage the teaching greenhouse here on campus. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an instructor in the department and they've been so supportive of this because we've been able to, to take the science that we do and one, deliver it in a kind of a, you know, laid back sort of way. Mm -hmm. uh, but two, uh, the story, one of the stories we're trying to tell through the show is, okay, you're a new student coming into plant sciences, you know, you're studying agronomy or horticulture or whatever. 
what's that going to look like in 20 years? Yep. You know, what, cause, cause I think we do a great job sometimes of giving and delivering the information and the knowledge and even yep. the tools to apply that. But the story we don't tell that feedback loop we don't close is okay. Career wise, right. You know, are you still going to care about this in 20 years? So I'm trying to find like faculty and people working in the field and researching mm -hmm. in the field from the university and outside of the university. And, and to tell that story of what makes you care about what you do long-term. Yeah. I really, uh, like I mentioned, I was able to forage, uh, through, see little plant thing. I was able to forage <laughs> through your, your, your back catalog a little bit in, in preparation. I do really like that. It's both uh, science communication, but it is still, quite human centered. Like at the end of the day, you're telling the story of the humans who are, I guess, what's up plant people, right? That's how right, you yeah. start. That's how you start your show. You're like, my, my, my plant peeps, you out there, Yeah. you know, and, and it also, which is interesting as someone who I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have identified as plant people prior to listening, but I do think there is a, a crossover accessibility to the conversation that, that I really like as well, where like, it seems, you know, it's, it's not just by and for the people who've chosen this as their career path. I also think there's some, some genuine general interest appeal to this uh, as well, because, you know, I think part of why many of us listen to podcasts is to almost like try on another life to a certain extent and just yeah. see what are people who really care about this stuff? Who are they? What is it like? What might it be like for me? And that combined with, you know, good science communication, good narrative elements, and not taking yourself too seriously. Um, right. That all mixed together into into something that I really was interested by. And, and I'm really happy that you're putting it out there. I'd love to get your thoughts as an educator about about really that, like about mm -hmm. education and about how either your experience teaching uh, in a greenhouse as opposed to in a classroom. Sure. And then also teaching, you know, through your microphone as opposed to in front of a chalkboard. Any thoughts on what that might have taught you that might be interested to folks who are listening to Trending in Education? Sure. Well, yeah, I've got, I've got a few thoughts. So my background before I started here at Texas Tech was with the um, Texas AgriLife Extension Service through Texas A&M University. Mm -hmm. So for those of you out there listening, if you don't know what Extension does, it's kind of the public education arm of land grant universities. So essentially take kind of what we're talking about. We take the science and, and we distill it for whoever needs it. Right. Because, you know, reading journal articles, uh, like I said, I'm writing a dissertation, I'm drowning in journal articles. I've been a scientist for a long time and I read some of these and I have to read them three or four times. And I'm like, I have no idea right. what this says. Mm -hmm. So, that's where, why science communication, I think, is so important. Because I think people in general, I was going to say people who use the science or benefit from the science, need to understand it. But if we're you know, hiding behind paywalls and we are writing in jargon, that's real hard. Yeah. It's really difficult. So from, from an educational standpoint, my educational background as an educator is in informal education. Yep. But I also teach at the collegiate level. So right. between labs and different things, just courses, I, I teach here too. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it doesn't have to be either or. And I yeah. think maybe it shouldn't be either or. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about this in, in one of my episodes a while back. I actually interviewed our department head, who's a great scientist and a, a great academic. And, and we talked about how uh, several things, but part of it was that, you know, the, the traditional student, as we think of it, is someone who get out of high school, you go and you study for four years and you go out and you get that, that person almost doesn't exist anymore. Right. In my opinion. Yep. I think that, you know, they're working full-time jobs. They are having all of these other life responsibilities that maybe the, the college student from 20, 30 years ago, uh, maybe even more recently than that didn't really have. Right. Uh, it's very different today. And mm -hmm. so, you know, everything I do from an educational standpoint is, okay, how do we, teach both the traditional student and this very non-traditional student. So yeah. my job here now is to manage this teaching greenhouse. We teach introductory horticulture classes, floral design, entomology, and a couple of other labs here. Nice. Yeah. So during a, a, a normal semester, which this one very much was not, yeah. uh, 
because of you know lockdowns and etc yeah 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 we were good though we made it i don't know how many minutes in but we made it pretty far without talking about the pandemic so yeah we, sorry i think we sorry, might I... no no we might like that was good job by us because i tell you know like <laughs> it's tough it's just for historical context it is towards the end of may 2020 so right. we're still heavily in the midst of uh the coronavirus and the response to the, the coronavirus which you know and i'm it's a trend spotting show on this end too so we have to talk about yeah yeah, COVID yeah, yeah. all the time, uh, and it's actually really interesting. But uh, but I imagine outside of the context of the way in which teaching in the greenhouse and trying to be a science communicator is changed by COVID, mm -hmm. it's pretty interesting stuff, irrespective of the pandemic response. So we want to make sure we're we're able to talk about both aspects of it. So sure. so maybe uh, but picking up with either side, honestly, just so that folks understand what's it like to teach. Yeah pre-COVID and then how, how has it changed in the last few months? Well, okay, so on an, in, during a normal semester, I'll run about 500 college students through my facility. Mm -hmm. We've got four classrooms here, one floral design, two general use, and then so we teach a lot of viticulture and enology, which is grape growing and winemaking. Yes. So we actually have a winemaking lab here. A the, popular right. course, I would imagine. It is, and it's what's funny is people are like, oh, I'm going to make wine, and then inevitably about three weeks in our students are like oh man this is hard i'm like yeah it's science like it's real science yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah normally i'll run about um 500 students through this facility we teach 16 to 18 sections of our intro hort class about 400 students yeah and you know at one point or the other whether i'm teaching or not i see all of them because right. i'm here running this place yeah my office is a uh, you can kind of see behind me is a glass box that is in like the middle of the greenhouse facility. So they all walk by my windows and you just kind of yeah. get used to it after a while. Yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, kind of a traditional semester. So part of my job is to make sure that uh, materials are here that they're going to need that, you know, uh, all the, the stuff that they need to actually properly ex execute the lab, that our TAs need to, to properly teach the lab is available mm -hmm. for them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whether it's pruners or potting media or plant materials, whatever it else. Yeah. That, that's a big part of my job. But very hands-on and uh, apply, like oh, yeah. even what yeah, yeah. you're describing, like the floral floral arrangements is not something I would have immediately jumped to mind. Oh yeah. But it's it's really interesting. And then, you know, I love the title Planthropology for like the, the name of the podcast. I'm a big, my, my listeners know I love portmanteaus. Mm -hmm. And that word may not have existed before. Is no, that, I is made that, that right? up. Oh yeah, my God, that. nice job. Are you are you on <laughs> Urban Dictionary or how are I you? I don't know, I should Yeah, look. yeah, yeah. We'll have, to, we'll have to double check that. But uh, but I do love the idea of putting this into a real practical context because mm -hmm. lots of education, higher education, formal education isn't always as practical perhaps as like a how-to video you might see on YouTube. Sure. And it does seem like your, even your formal education is, is sort of in the context of a lab where you're actually doing, yeah. working with living things and producing outputs that you, you may not want to drink <laughs> the, the wine exactly, right. but you still are learning by doing, right? Yeah. And, and so, you know, this intro horticulture class is some, 90% non-majors, right? Mm -hmm. Mostly freshmen. Mm -hmm. We have a great relationship with the advisors on campus. And, and in fact, every semester we do an advisor's breakfast here at the greenhouse where yeah. we bring them out, we feed them, we talk to them about our courses, we mm -hmm. send them home with a succulent or some other plant. But, you know, and it, it's not bribery, but it's also not not bribery, yeah. <laughs> you know, somewhere in between. Right. But we've got a great relationship with them. So when students come in and they're like, I need a general science credit. They're like, go take horticulture, right? Right, right. And we've we have beefed up the class so that it's on par with, you know, intro chemistry, intro sure. bio. We teach yeah. enough and do enough that they they get the whole experience. But in the lab, let, let me let me take a step back. Agriculture in general, agricultural sciences, horticulture is very applied, mm -hmm. right? It's how do you take a seed and produce someone's dinner or mm -hmm. someone's blue jeans. You know, we grow a lot of cotton up here in my part of the country. And so sure. we feel, I, personally I feel, but I think we feel as a department that knowledge is excellent, right? Knowledge is excellence. We want to give the knowledge that, that our students need, the information. But also being such an applied field, we wanna make sure that our students can take that knowledge 
and apply it to their lives. And, and so we don't just teach the, the information, we try to teach problem solving. Mm -hmm. And we try to teach as much as we can, just, just everyday application. Because honestly, out of those 400 students, we might pick up a couple per semester that want to be plant science majors. Right. Most of them are going to go do other things, business or right. uh, art or English, whatever else. Mm -hmm. But if they can one day, you know, own a home or be growing something on a, on a porch and say, yep. you know what, I remember germinating a seed and I right. remember a little bit about growing a cucumber or a tomato. Right. Then we've had a real tangible positive impact on that person's life. Yeah, you know, it, it's making me think about the the mindfulness movement, which is uh, very top of mind nowadays. Everyone's, uh, you know, thinking focused on their breathing and sort of coming, <laughs> right. coming together in terms of uh, balancing the, the stresses of their life and learning how to be reflective. It was interesting for me as I was even preparing for this show, I became more conscious of the plants in my life. And as funny as that might sound, at least to me, it is true. Like we live in this context of you know, plant life. And I think without the, the consciousness raising that I think your show is, is doing in combination with the, the more formal education, understanding actually how I'll grow plants or how I'll right. learn how to be a, a professional, it is also just, there, there is a bit of insight and reflection that comes with understanding it's not just humans, it's not just humans and animals, it's just, not just humans and technology and infrastructure. There also, there's also this deeper context that our whole biosphere exists in that is maybe not predominantly plant-based, but it's pretty freaking plant-based, especially <laughs> if you're talking about the, the living side of, the, and it's, I said biosphere, right? So, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. so I'm not a science communicator, but I was kind of uh, in the neighborhood here on some of yeah, this stuff, yeah. right? Well, and I like to tell people that, that plants are both at the bottom and the top of the food chain. Mm. Right. So they they're, they're they're the food that we eat or they're the food that our food eats. Right. Mm. Whether, right. you know, whether it's insects or, you know, our livestock or just directly us, we cannot survive on this planet without plant life. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's more complex than that. There's the, you know, fungal life and bacteria and everything that goes with it. Yeah. Uh, but then at the end, those plants are cycling the, the, you know, crude matter that makes us up back into more life yeah and so they they exist both at the bottom and the top of the food chain and mm -hmm. you know in this in this world we live in today in you know with a changing climate with a lot of denial about that with a lot of and and, and i i use the word denial a little loosely because i think a lot of times it comes down to a lack of understanding mm -hmm. maybe through no fault of most people right like we're I'm not sure we're across the board teaching ecology and plant science and all yeah. these things appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, we teach very often in terms of utility rather than intrinsic value. Yes. And so if we can understand that, okay, yeah, there's a dandelion in your yard. It, it's serving a purpose in the ecosystem. Now yeah. I'm, I'm a turf guy. Like I like having a nice lawn. I'll yeah. pull dandelions and mow them out. But I also understand that at the beginning of the season, if my turf grass is still dormant, I'll leave the dandelions out there for early pollinators. I'll right. leave those things. And so I think that. And for kids too. I mean, one of yeah. my early memories was uh, picking up, I was helping to germinate. I mean, in retrospect, I, you know, some people who were taking care of their lawns, probably resented my, my <laughs> wistful blowing on the dandelion seeds. But it, but it is like those aspects of what it means to be human that sort of ties to a longer, deeper history is frequently, and that's why I did like the portmanteau, no joke, the idea of like the planthropology, the, the blending between humanity and the plants around us, I really think is fascinating. And, and I'd also love to get, get a little more of your perspective on sure. the the pop culture and sci-fi aspects of this too, because because I wanna I wanna tease and tantalize with a little bit of the edutainment. I'm a big fan of mixing in a little fun with your learning, mixing right. in a little resonant pop culture uh, stuff. But uh, but there was a really interesting uh, episode of your show where you were at the Lubbock Comic Con, yeah, talking about science fiction and comics. Uh, you were talking about Groot. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lord, of, Lord of the Rings and, and, and the Venus flytrap, Seymour, you yeah. know, 
not Seymour. Seymour was the the guy. Venus. Yeah, it was uh, Audrey was, Two from Audrey the, Two. Little so, Shop Horrors. Yeah. So so I think there's almost like a mythic element to humans' relationship with plant life, and I like that you were able to kind of touch on that even as you drill into the harder aspects of the science. Any thoughts on that? Like how you kind of navigate, you know, between those two universes? Sure. You know, and that's an interesting question. So uh, this this may sound, this is going to sound like a departure, but I, I, it makes sense in my brain. Mm -hmm. Setting is important. And and so I had a, I guess, a trainer when I was working with Extension when I first started who was just, you know, teaching us about how to be good educators. And And, and one thing he said that has always stuck with me, you know, six, seven years later is that everything speaks. Mm. everything speaks. And what he was saying is like, so when you host a program, whether it's a, a formal course or, you know, an informal course that just, you know, anyone can come, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Everything from the spacing between the chairs to the temperature of the room, to the light intensity, to your manner of dress and everything else speaks to one, your credibility and two, the learning experience of the person that's in that room. Yeah. Right. So, I, I pull that forward to my greenhouse. And in addition to the greenhouse, we have about 20,000 square feet of greenhouse space, the classrooms, and about two, two and a half acres of horticultural garden that surrounds the facility. And I kind of mm -hmm. oversee all of it. Nice. But my thought as an educator and, and as the manager of this place is, is if I don't care enough to keep our plants looking good and our greenhouse looking good and our everything managed why should the students that are coming in to learn about those things care about learning? Mm -hmm. Right. If I don't care, there's no reason they should care. Right. So you take that because the setting matters. It matters that things look good. It matters that the plants aren't, you know, crappy when they come in to propagate them or whatever else, or, right, or right. learn about different plant materials. So taking that forward to, to storytelling in this, this, this uh, uh, live show that I did, which was again, super nerdy and a lot of fun. When, when, when I think when writers are world building and good world builders, so like Tolkien was, like mm -hmm. so many others have been, mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis, and there's a lot of other no notable examples. Mm -hmm. There has to be an element, in my opinion, of, of realism or it's just too different for people to connect to. Yep. For me, I read a lot of sci-fi and fantasy. I'm, you know, I'm kind of a sucker for campy, like space opera yeah, audio yeah. books and stuff like that. But like if they land on a planet and everything is just so foreign, I can't connect to it. Right. And so I think an easy trick that world builders have, maybe not easy, but a, a powerful trick that world builders have is build the environment, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. this, you know, if they're talking about a tree, like this person lands on this planet and this tree had all these features, but it kind of reminded them of a redwood or it kind mm -hmm. of reminded them of this that they know. Right. I, I think it helps pull us in the story. Mm -hmm. And it helps pull us into the world that they're trying to create. And so I think plants are powerful in storytelling and environment is powerful in storytelling just because it gives us this, again, anthropological connection mm -hmm. to the story we're being told. And I think that's important in uh, uh, fantasy and fiction. I think it's also very important in education that we can tie the things that we're teaching, the things that we're learning back to our lives and back to the things that we understand and we recognize. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a great insight. And uh, it is a reminder that frequently we do take the, the plants in our lives for granted or like the, the fact that the, we're, we're surrounded by these things. You know, I was thinking back to Middle Earth uh, <laughs> based in part on your, your, your show where you, where you dove into some of that. And I do have really deep recollections of the sense of setting, which frequently is based on the, the forests or the, the Ents or the, right. you know, even Mordor, you know, like going through, going through the mountains and, and like, you know, there always is this sense of place and um, how everything is alive to a certain extent. And I, and I think in some ways that that is almost like a ethno botanical perspective, which, which I really think is fascinating. I would love to hear maybe a, a, a few thoughts from you on trends you're tracking, whether within, you know, education or within botany and horticulture or, or really just anything that you're seeing in the world around you. But, uh, but I'd love to get uh, a little time for you to wax uh, futuristic and, uh, and trend spotting. Like what things do you see picking up in the spaces that you pay the most attention to? 
Sure. So we'll start, I guess, with the world of, of plants and, and horticulture. So I think a good way to track what's important or maybe important is not the right word. I think a good way to track what is current in, especially in the sciences, but maybe in academics in general, is to see where the funding lives, yeah. right? What, especially in, in tight times like we're in now, mm -hmm. what projects, what fields are still really being funded by NIH or whoever else, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. So right now, one of the big focuses is on food, food production, food mm -hmm. systems, whether that is how do we, and I, well, and, and I'll mention my thoughts on this a little bit more, but from what I'm seeing, it's like, how do we improve um, local markets, uh, yep. regional food markets and food systems? How do we improve the safety of both domestic and imported foodstuffs? How mm -hmm. do we be more efficient with our production strategies? Yeah. Uh, because we live in a world of, in terms of resources, diminishing returns. And, you know, uh, our, our water supplies are not getting more plentiful. Our uh, available land is becoming more urban. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've got to figure out how do we feed, and our, and our population is not slowing down. You know, they're right. saying what, 9 billion on the planet by 2050. Right. And that's a lot of hungry people mm -hmm. that, that need to be fed. And so mm -hmm. in our field, we're looking at what new things can we try, whether that's through hydroponics, um, which we do a lot of here at the greenhouse. We, we have a lot of research in hydroponics or using the small space that we have more efficiently through gene development and plant breeding and mm -hmm. just improved practices and technologies. Yeah. So in, in the plant world, or in the ag science world, that's where I see us heading is towards more nutrient dense foods with less miles on them. And, right. and what I mean by that is uh, food miles is something we talk about, like how far does your apple have to travel before you eat it, right? Right, right. Mm -hmm. And that ties into uh, uh, CO2 emissions. It ties into uh, a lot of things, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, you know this is this is a concept I think. Oh, maybe some people don't think about, but the longer plants are really good at turning water and soil and air and sunlight into nutrients that you need, right? <laughs> right? right. That is their that's maybe not their purpose necessarily, yeah. but they're really good at it. It's the core competency. It's the top of their LinkedIn. You know, they know <laughs> we'll, we'll yeah. hire them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Turn, turn sunlight into food, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So the longer we leave a tomato on the plant. A longer, the longer we leave an apple on the tree, mm -hmm. the more nutrient dense that's going to be and the, the more beneficial it's going to be to the person eating it. But the problem is you can't pick a tomato that's fully ripe and ship it across the world. Right. right? It doesn't hold up and you need to talk, think about shelf time and mm -hmm. fridge time and all that. So how do we balance that? Is it through uh, local markets? I kind of think that's where the future is going to be in agriculture is more regionalized food webs. Right. Or do we use different kinds of technologies to let our food ripen more right. and then figure out how to preserve it for longer? So lots of cool science and research going forward. That's great stuff. I, I appreciate it. I feel like the food miles, I hadn't heard that expression. I, I like that. I like that a lot. And then I could see how some of your shows are also talking about positions on GMOs and trying mm -hmm. to understand how much is that the, the path to take versus the the local market conversation. And then uh, again, in light of the pandemic, supply chains, uh, you know, I don't go more than a few hours without hearing someone, including myself, talk about <laughs> supply chains these days. Sure. So, uh, so that's very much top of mind, I'm sure. It's not like you might have ideas about other trends uh, as well. So I'd love to hear uh, more of your thoughts since we have you. Sure. So in, in, in education, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier in the show, I believe, but I think th there's two sides to this in my mind. I think that there is some good I think there's actually a lot of good in the academic world that's going to come out of all of this. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be being more accessible to our students, you know, figuring out more ways to integrate our education online. I, I interviewed a professor recently from our, for the show, from our ag agricultural education and communications department. Right. And what she was saying is that, you know, she's teaching several classes, both lower and upper level. And she said, you know, it's really made me reevaluate what I find is important, you know, in, in distance education. If they don't have a paper in by midnight on this day, right? you know, in light of everything going, that's going on, is that really that big of a deal? Mm -hmm. You know, as long as they're keeping up and getting their work done and learning, mm -hmm. is that really a big deal? And as, as weird as it is, and I talked about this on an episode too, it is in some ways, even though we're at a distance, forcing us 
to connect to some of our students as human beings. Yes. Because they get on and you may be the only person they've talked to that day. Yeah. Right. On your Zoom conference. And sure. they may just want to tell you about their day. Yeah. And the fact that as educators, we should be educating not just the seat in a classroom, but the human being in that seat. Yep, yep. And connecting with them on a personal level. Because I know I learn better as a, a longtime student right. if my professor gives a crap about me. Right, you know right. what I mean? And so I think that's one positive that if we can hang on to that, I think that's one positive that may come out of this. Yeah. Also, again, like figuring out how do we take um, our, our material and deliver it in a new way. So those mm -hmm. students that have to work 40 hours a week or maybe are, you know, have kids or families or all this stuff that are not the traditional 18 year old, I just got out of high school right. Kind of person. Right. Um, and still make their learning experience worthwhile and, right. and right. important and all that. I think, you know, over the next 10 years, I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't think any of us do at this point, but right. Right. you know, we're having discussions at the university level at, you know, okay. Above my pay grade at the university level of what's this fall semester going to look like? Right. Uh, is it hybrid classes where uh, maybe we rotate, students through the classroom and they mm -hmm. get the rest of it online. Is it all online? Mm -hmm. Do we change the span of our semester? I read, I read an article a couple of days ago talking about some universities in California, thinking about maybe starting a little bit earlier in August and being done before Thanksgiving. Right. Because, you know, if you've been in, on a college campus that week after Thanksgiving before right. Uh, winter break is just worthless. Right. <laughs> it's terrible. Yeah. No one wants to be there. The professors, the students, everyone's burned out and tired. Yeah, yeah. So do we condense things a little bit more and be done a little bit earlier? You know, I don't know what some of the answers are and I don't know what it's going to look like. But as educators, I think we need to take this time and this as terrible as it, it's been in, in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and as terrible on a global scale, as devastating as it's been, I think we've got to look at this as an opportunity to reevaluate what's important in academia mm -hmm. and in our educational approach. And, yeah. and for me, I'm a very, you know, I'm an okay researcher. I'm not a great scientific writer, but I think I'm a pretty good educator because sure. my, my focus has always been how do I make the learning experience the best it can be for the students right. uh, in terms of everything we've talked about setting everything from setting to the actual information that they're given. And I, I think that we need to use this opportunity um, to really evaluate that in our own teaching philosophies and everything else. Yeah. That was a really long winded answer. No, it's good. I like it. It, it had my wheels turning uh, in, in a few different directions, uh, which, which, I, which I think is great. And, uh, you know, it does remind me of, you know, knowing your audience and understanding. I did think you're, when you were talking about distance education, I thought that was a really interesting conversation because there's also the risk of alienating folks mm -hmm. who are too far afield from maybe a traditional, you know, woke undergrad, which is sort of the, <laughs> the sort of archetypal, <laughs> I want to design for a woke undergrad when yeah, yeah. you're communicating to someone later on in their life, maybe you're yeah. communicating to a farmer, maybe you're communicating to someone who's, who's really just open in the first, for the first time to really growing their understanding about horticulture or botany and, you know, trying to meet them where they are in a way that is empathetic and not condescending is, is a lot harder than it sounds. Sure. Sure. And then, is. and then when it's done well, it's almost that notion of stealth learning where at the yeah. end of the conversation, you've sneaked up on someone and, and they actually are, are bettered through the exchange. So Love to get some more thoughts. We're in like the free form interpretive <laughs> point in the podcast now, but it's been wanderful having you on. And also, so we mentioned uh, Planthropology as the yeah. podcast available anywhere folks are interested in a podcast. What about, uh, you know, folks who want to get more Vikram in their lives? Any other uh, thoughts uh, as far as where, where they should go, what they should do? Hell man, I, I probably do uh, more social media than I should in general. Uh, so, you know, I've got the play anthropology stuff on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. I'm not great at Twitter. I don't love Twitter, but mm -hmm. whatever. So we also have a Facebook group called Play Anthropology's Cool Plant People. And it's just folks that, you know, kind of hang out, ask garden questions, you nice. know, share memes, whatever. It's it's pretty fun. Yeah. I run a some social media accounts for our greenhouse facility here and garden facility. It's just Texas Tech Greenhouse. Mm -hmm. Uh 
we have a Twitter, but it's not really very active. So, but Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. Um, so we do little educational things. We'll talk about what the students are doing in our labs, post pictures from the garden. We've got a couple of greenhouse cats that are by far the most popular things nice. I post. Nice. I don't even like cats, man. And it's like, I'm yeah. stuck with these two, but. Did they have their own accounts yet or? Uh, no, okay, I just good, refuse. Good. Yeah, I just won't line, do it. Hold the line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have enough to do. Yeah. Uh, I do some photography and, and some stuff on the side just as a, a creative outlet. Sure. You know? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, you mentioned stealth learning a minute ago. And that's, I, I'll be honest, that's kind of my. Uh, mo for the podcast and mm-hmm. and maybe as an educator in general like i try to keep it as laid back and relaxed and conversational as we can and yep. and you know we throw jokes in we laugh all of that right but i also hope that listeners pick up a couple of things along the way that mm-hmm. like oh i never thought about that or whatever and you know i feel like my job both as a podcaster and even as a, to, to a certain extent even as a formal educator is not I have to be careful saying this maybe, but is not to tell my listeners or my students everything about a subject because I can't, do, it's impossible, right? You yep. can't, I think my job is to spark enough wonder and interest in the subject mm-hmm. that they're willing to dive deeper, mm-hmm. whether it's in the mesquite trees or, you know, like we talked about in the first episode or, yeah. you know, these students that are non-majors just in horticulture in general. It's like, I'm, I'm kind of a generalist in nature, but I feel like if I can tell, if I can just get someone interested, if I can be excited enough mm-hmm. to get someone interested, that they will go and do their own research. It teaches them how to do research. It teaches them how to find information and it gives them something new to talk about and think about. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, I feel like, again, both from the podcast and the social media stuff I do, and even in the classroom, I feel like that's my job. And that's what gets me excited about doing my job. Great stuff. Uh, thanks so much to Vikram Baliga, host of Planthropology Podcast, apparently a social media maven uh, <laughs> and uh, a science communicator and educator and someone someone really fun to listen to. And uh, thanks again for, for joining us. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. And to our listeners, we'll be back again soon on Trending in Education.